Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to be talking about essential herbal supplies. What you need, what you don't, and golly what would be really nice to have. So I'm going to start the video by prefacing that today I'm not going to be talking about carrier oils, alcohols, you know, uh, beeswax, those types of ingredients or dried herbs. I actually have a video about how to source dried herbs since we're moving into the winter seasons here in the Northern Hemisphere. That would be great information to have. So I'll definitely link that video above. What I'm going to be talking about today was actually a Patreon request in terms of what type of herbal equipment do I need if I'm just starting out and what things would be really nice to have. And since I've been doing this for a while and I thought this was an excellent re Patreon request, um, I really wanted to share some of my favorite tools, why I like them and which ones uh, are necessary to start out with and which ones you can slowly save up for. So thank you to Michelle for requesting this video. I'm going to try to keep it fairly concise and organized. So what I'm going to start with is wild harvesting supplies because most of the herbs that I work with either are grown on my property or are harvested fresh from the wild. A lot of the supplies I need fall under that category as well. So I'll start with harvesting. First and foremost, you're going to need a really good quality field guide. I have another video about this. This is the Newcombs wildflower guide. I'll post a link to the book in the description below, but I'm also going to post a link here to the video that I talk about how to use this book, why I like it so much. I do think if you're going to be harvesting in the wild, it's really, really wise to have a good quality field guide to make sure you know what you're harvesting and how to harvest it safely, all those types of things. So I do like the Newcombs wildflower guide. There are others out there, of course, use the ones that you like. So when I first started, you know, I thought I would be all cool <laughs> and, and have a harvesting knife. And um, other than the one that I recently had custom made for me, I found working with knives really, really cumbersome. So in terms of harvesting in the wild, the number one thing you're really gonna need is a decent pair of scissors. So just go out, get yourself a good pair of scissors because um, they there's really very few herbs that scissors won't work with. Now I have, as I mentioned, a custom made uh, bowling blade um, that I had made. Not necessary to have something funky and cool like this. I went for years just using scissors, but sometimes it is nice just to have, um, you know, a harvesting blade that's specific for working with herbs, but scissors will do and everybody has them in their kitchen. Another thing that if you're going to be harvesting in the wild, that's nice to have, but not 100% necessary is a spring scale. And if any of the folks watching uh, fish or have anyone in the family who fish, you've probably seen these before, but this one only goes up to a thousand grams. And so it's great for when you're in the wild because you can click your, your little paper or paper bag or plastic bag. I usually just bring plastic bags and you can weigh your herb material out while you're out harvesting. So this ensures that one, you're not going to come home with too little or coming home with too much and end up having to compost a bunch. So while this isn't, 100% accurate. It does give me a rough idea. If I need 87 grams of herb material to make a particular tincture, I usually try to get about 100 grams when I'm out in the wild. And that again, it ensures I'm not wasting any herb material and it ensures that when I get home, I have enough to make what it is that I need to make. So in terms of wild harvesting, those are your essential tools, you know, I mean, other than of course, things like sunscreen and water, but you can cover those on your own, a good wildflower guide, a decent pair of scissors. And if you want to get fancy, get yourself a spring scale. They're not too expensive. Uh, they're easy to find on places like Amazon, or if you have like a science equipment store. So next in terms of, I'll go on to tinctures and what supplies would be really nice to have. This is my handy dandy, potato ricer and I have been using this for years. It's kind of like a giant garlic press. Isn't that neat? And in terms of pressing infused oils, pressing tinctures, pressing vinegars, even elderberry syrup, this has been one of the most inexpensive yet, yet, yet 
most used tools that I have in my apothecary. One day I do hope to save up for a tincture press, but that falls under the golly wouldn't that be nice to have category since they start at minimum three, four hundred dollars and the hydraulic tincture presses can go up into the thousands. And you know, as someone who runs a clinical practice, I'm still getting away with my potato ricer. So I highly recommend getting these because it allows you to squeeze, you know, the last of that herbal oil and the last of those tinctures right out um, of your menstruum. And so you're not wasting things. Now, in a, if you're on a tight budget, you know, cheesecloth will also do the trick. For many years, I was wringing out my herbs using cheesecloth. And sometimes this is a more preferred option for when you're working with oils. Uh, if you don't want a lot of oil going down your drain when you wash your potato ricer, um, or if you, you know, just going to want to throw out those herb materials afterwards, sometimes cheesecloth can be a good friend too. And in addition, you're going to need a few sieves of some kind. I'm gonna see if I can get close to the camera for this one. See how fine mesh that is? If you can get your hands on a fine mesh sieve, you're gonna be really, really happy that you did. But most people have these in their kitchen, right? So you do, again, you don't have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money on things um, to get yourself started. If you do plan on blending tinctures and working with formulating, at some point you're going to want to get your hands on some graduated cylinders. Other than in my clinic, where I am blending custom tinctures for my clients. I've never used a graduated cylinder for anything else in terms of making salves, butters, um, you know, infused vinegars, anything like that. This is solely for tincture making and tincture formulating. So if you plan on blending multiple herbs together, and this is because the graduated cylinders go up to 100 milliliters. This one does, and this one goes up to 50. So you can get more accurate measurements than you would using, say, a large measuring cup. So in terms of formulating, these are an excellent investment, and I strongly recommend that you get a bottle brush if you do plan on getting a graduated cylinder, or get yourself a set that comes with a bottle brush. Uh, tinctures tend to have a lot of resins in them, and over the years, these can become quite stained and actually difficult to read the numbers. These ones are brand new because that had happened to my old one. And I also like to have backups. They are made out of glass. And I do recommend you get glass ones um, if you can. So I'm just gonna move these out of the way because I tend to talk with my hands and I don't need my new graduated cylinders smashing all over the floor. So next in terms of herbal equipment, I really strongly recommend getting a kitchen scale. This is going to come in handy if you want to make salves, if you want to um, blend teas. There's really, I think other than my potato ricer, this is my second most used item in the herbal apothecary or in the herbal kitchen because it is so versatile. And as you start delving into recipes, even the recipes I share in my new book, many of them are going to be by weight. So 100 grams of beeswax, 30 grams of shea butter, and it really does help to have a kitchen scale. You know, even I use it for measuring out, like weighing out my parcels before I mail them out. So for the 20 to $30 investment, highly, highly recommend having a kitchen scale. So of course I've talked about, you know, measuring cups. You're probably going to need multiple measuring cups. And if you do plan on working with beeswax, be okay with sacrificing at least one of your measuring cups to the beeswax gods. Uh, beeswax is really, really hard to clean off of things, really hard. And you know, chances are if you're going to be using a measuring cup to pour out your salves into your containers, it's gonna be very difficult to clean and you don't want wax going down the drain. So I do recommend having separate implements for beeswax. So moving on to my double boiler. Uh, this kind of follows the same vein. If you're going to be making soaps, salves, ointments, uh, whipped body butters, you're going to want a double boiler. And a double boiler is simply two pots. The bottom is filled with water and the top is filled with the ingredients you wish to melt. This prevents these ingredients from burning. And when we're working with herbal infused oils and beeswax and those types of things, 
We don't want them exposed to high heat. The oils can go rancid and the herbs can burn quite easily. That being said, if you have one of these already in your kitchen, I do strongly recommend again that you get one for beeswax only. They're, they're a bugger to clean. <laughs> and the easiest way to clean them, I'm not usually a big fan of using paper towels a lot in my kitchen, but the easiest way is while the wax is still liquid to use paper towels and to wipe them out because there's really no other way to get these suckers clean, <laughs> but invaluable. And so I have two, I have two that I only, one that I only melt beeswax in for when I'm making candles and one that I have butters and oils and things in as well, but again, not necessary. Golly would be nice to have, would be a double boiler with a handle and a pouring lip. So similar to your lip, on your measuring cup. If you could find a double boiler that has a pouring lip like that, it's gonna make your life much easier when you're pouring out your salves into your containers um, because pouring from these can be very, very messy and not very accurate. So that would fall under my golly, wouldn't that be nice to have? So you can see a lot of these things are stuff that you're just gonna find in your kitchen. And so there's no need to spend thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars, those types of things, investing in these really crazy expensive um, pieces of equipment. So next I'm gonna move on to just a couple of other items that I think are really important. One would be, of course, mason jars. You can use the smaller mason jars for salve making or whipped body butters or, you know, uh, even um, like herbal scrubs, like salts all types of things. So again, you don't really have to invest a ton of money into containers that are super pretty if you're just gonna be using it for yourself. These also work really, really well for making herbal infused oils and for making tinctures. My only suggestion is if you're gonna be working with um, alcohol, vinegars, or anything like that, that you're also gonna want a roll of parchment paper because the parchment paper goes in between the jar and the lid to prevent corrosion. You just like being in the videos, eh? <laughs> We've got a snowy day here and homeschool starts soon, doesn't it? Yeah. So I've got two more items that I wanna to talk to you about. And the first would be a really good quality knife. Now you don't have to get a Metzaluna. If you've seen some of my previous videos where I have um, chopped herbs for tinctures or for herbal infused oils, you will see how fabulous this is. If you work it, in a rocking motion when you're chopping your herbs and it makes the chopping really, really efficient and really quick. That being said, you don't have to use one of these. You can just use a regular old kitchen knife. If you have good kitchen knife skills and you can chop really quickly, use your favorite knife. I just happen to prefer a Mezzaluna, right? Why do you think it gets the name Mezzaluna? <laughs> what shape is the blade kind of like? A moon. A moon, that's right. That's where it gets its name from. And last but not least, excuse me, kiddo. No, thank you, okay? Last but not least would be a mortar and pestle. And this to me does not fall under the category of herbal pieces of equipment that you need right away. I actually don't use my mortar and pestle that often. And perhaps it's because I tend to work mostly with fresh herb material, but when I do have to make fresh poultices or if I have to grind, herbs, or if I do work with dried herbs to make medicines, I like to pound them first to help activate some of the essential oils and release some of the aroma before working with them. So that's when a mortar and pestle could come in handy. Like this? That's it. Yeah. So this last little segment, I want to talk to you about something that is vital for me in terms of the way I practice my herbal medicine, but it might not be for you. So I wanted to film it separately. The way that I was trained and my beliefs are that plants are not commodities, that they, um, they exist in our ecosystem just like everything else that is this beautiful spider web of interactions that we all depend and rely upon each other. Uh, perhaps in your beliefs, if you um, believe in things like animism, that plants have spirits, they are not simply on this planet for us to use. And so because of that belief and because of the school I chose and the way that I was trained, um, I always leave an offering when I harvest a herb. This is not necessary, um, but for me it is, as I say, necessary for my herbal practice. 
When I first started out, I was laying down tobacco as a thanks because that is what I was trained to do. But since then, my practice has evolved, my spiritual beliefs have evolved, and I tend to work with different herbs now. Um, but I always, I always remind people that um, working with herbs involves having respect, having humility, and understanding that we need those herbs that like, they provide us with medicine they provide us with nutrition um, they provide us with healing and so there is a reciprocity there you know we could not be healthy or exist without plants and so giving thanks is not a bad thing you can do this by laying down some herbs as a thank you i know some people who are reiki practitioners who will actually give the plant some reiki as a thank you um, even just acknowledging that there is a reciprocal relationship there goes a long way and so one thing that I always have with me whether I'm harvesting on my property or if I'm harvesting out in the wild is my little herb pouch I tend to lay down um, herbs like mugwort and juniper uh, they are you know sacred to me and um, a part of like sort of my ancestral practice but you do what works for you. Again, if this part of working with plants doesn't resonate with you, that's fine as well. It's why I wanted to kind of keep it separate from the rest of them. So thank you so very much for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Perhaps there's some herbal equipment that you find essential in your practice that you would like to share. Those are always useful pieces of information. So I love it when people share that. And until next time, this is Corrine from Spirea Herbs, wishing you health and wellness.